Well, in this lecture, I'm going to discuss a few things about material testing. Uh, so we will follow chapter two of uh, the book uh, by Shigley. And uh, what we would like to cover today is uh, the tensile test, how it is performed, uh, a few of the parameters that uh, are defined uh, from the tensile test. And uh, then we'll uh, also discover some things about what happens to a metallic material when you actually uh, redo the tensile test on it uh, and make it uh, stronger. Uh, and that is the idea of cold work. So let's uh, first uh, discuss how is the tensile test uh, performed. So in this case, uh, we will have here uh, the uh, uh, stress strain curve that uh, you all know. And if we take just two axes here to represent the stress and the strain, we would like to perform uh, tension uh, on a specimen. And the specimen uh, geometry is uh, uh, the dog bone uh, geometry that uh, looks like this. So we have a specimen and the specimen has grips. And then we apply a force uh, on both sides of that uh, material. And then we will uh, designate the gauge length, which is the distance between uh, the two points in the middle section uh, of that uh, specimen as L0. So L0 is here. And let's assume that we're going to call the engineering strain. So we're going to use the terminology engineering uh, to designate stress and strain in the following fashion. So engineering strain is uh, the change in length divided by the original length and that is delta L over L. And um, the engineering stress sigma is uh, uh, equal to the load divided by the original uh, area of the sample cross-section. Um, and uh, now if we take uh, these two quantities and plot them, we will see that we have one part of that graph is going to be a straight line. So it is uh, the elastic portion of the graph. And then we will start having deviations from that straight line. And uh, then as the load increases, then the stress will increase. And then finally, the material is going to expand, extend, and become weaker, and then eventually it will fail. So if this is sigma and this is epsilon, we would define a few things here. Uh, first, yield uh, is before we get to the yield, there is a point at which you will have deviations from the linearity. And let's call this point as the proportional limit. So PL uh, point is the proportional limit. So beyond that, we don't have proportionality between the stress and strain. And then we're going to have another point here that will be defined as the elastic limit. So this point here is EL, elastic limit. And uh, what happens in the elastic limit by definition is that if we unload the material at that point at that stress that is sigma elastic limit in other words if i put sigma here sub el and sigma sub pl sigma sub pl is the stress that defines the transition from proportionality to some nonlinearity and then sigma el is the point at which elasticity ceases to describe the material. So if I unload the material at that point, uh, then I will go, I'll find that I have the unloading follows a straight line, and the straight line is parallel to the original uh, straight line that defines elasticity. So upon loading, we're going up 
uh, in this uh, red line and unloading we're going to go down uh, on the uh, green line so what happens is that when we unload at this point here we get an offset and the offset strain we're going to call it a this is an offset strain so a is equal to offset strain upon unloading from the elastic limit uh, so by convention or by definition the committee that decided uh, a standardized way to define the yield point for at least uh, steels in in most of the cases is that when a is equal to 0.2 percent then uh, it would be a standard way to define um, if the permanent offset is 0.2 percent strain that will be defined as the yield point and notice that 0.2 percent is in reality 0 0.002 that is uh, two and a thousand delta l over l is two and a thousand to define the yield point uh, <clears throat> if we look at this curve a little bit more carefully we'll see that we have also another point here and at this point here the corresponding strain is going to become epsilon u or defined as epsilon u and epsilon u is the ultimate strain and uh, corresponding to this ultimate strain so the corresponding stress at this point is uh, a material property we're going to call it s sub u s sub u if i just uh, move myself a little bit is the material property that defines the ultimate strength of the material so moving on we'll find that i can actually um, have a definition uh, for both the ultimate strength of the material and the yield so the yield now we're going to give it uh, the uh, symbol S sub Y. This is the yield strength of the material. And the ultimate, we're going to give it the symbol S sub U. And that is the ultimate strength of the material. Um, now, these, these are uh, all good definitions when we follow the engineering conventions of defining the stress and strain. However, as we would know, as we stretch the material, the cross-sectional area is going to decrease and the length is going to increase. And uh, therefore, if there's a significant change in the dimensions of the sample, we have to be a little bit careful and we're going to define stress and strain incrementally. And that is the idea of true stress and true strain. So now we're going to define true uh, strain and the true strain is epsilon sub t and that is defined as all of the accumulation of strains that happen by incrementally when we stretch the material so this is sigma of delta l i over l i where l i is a state from uh, size initial size all the way to the final size or we can actually define it as an integral so epsilon uh, true is equal to the integral from the initial length l0 to the current length l of dl over l so if you do this integration it's very easy you find that this is the log of l divided by l0 and uh, since l is um, larger than l0 then we can actually divide it up as ln of 1 plus delta l divided by l0 and uh, knowing that delta l over l0 is by definition the engineering uh, strain we can rewrite this equation as ln of 1 plus epsilon where epsilon is the engineering strain. So for that, we have a connection between the true strain and the engineering strain. 
So let's uh, uh, now continue on to write these expressions. So let me put myself back here and uh, write the expression for the relationship between the true stress and the engineering stress. So if I do that, then I see that um, the true stress, I'm going to call it uh, the same symbol as sigma, but I'm going to give it the superscript prime to differentiate it from uh, the engineering value. So sigma prime is actually the load divided by the current area. So A is the current area, not the original area. And if I want to connect the true strain to the engineering, uh, the true stress to the engineering stress, uh, all what I have to do is rearrange this by dividing by A0 and multiplying by A0 over A. And uh, since I know that P over A0 is defined as sigma, so this is the engineering value, then what is left is finding a way to describe what is A0 over A. A0 over A <coughs> can be obtained from the fact that the volume is conservative. In other words, the product of L times A is equal to A0 times L0. And therefore, I can replace A0 over A by L over L0. And L over L0, as we have seen, is just 1 plus epsilon. <coughs> so I have one equation here for uh, computation of the true stress from knowing the engineering values, and another equation for computation of the true strain from engineering values. And that is, uh, as we've seen uh, for the true strain, that is the ln of 1 plus epsilon. So if I take equation 1 and equation 2, and I have a set of values from the engineering test, I can reconstruct a true relationship between the stress and the strain. And this relationship, I can put it in another graph. And the other graph is going to be uh, to look like this. So if I just have another graph that represents now the sigma prime versus uh, epsilon t from the data that I acquired and the two relationships, then I can I see that I have actually um, a relationship that's going to be elastic initially, and then it will continually increase all the way until we have fracture point F in here. So the relationship between the stress, true stress and true strain is going to be an ever increasing function. And on that function, we're going to note that we have now easily defined value for the final point at which the material fails. And this final point has two coordinates. This value is epsilon f. And this is a true strain at failure. And this value is sigma ultimate prime, which is the ultimate strength of the material um, when it fails. And uh, I mean, this is the fracture, um, the fracture stress at which the material will fail. However, if I look at the ultimate point, which was at the uh, maximum of the previous uh, curve of, that represents engineering values, they will translate to a point somewhere in the middle, and this will be epsilon uh, ultimate true. This is true. And uh, here, sigma, or S ultimate, let me just kind of take that back, S ultimate true, uh, which will be, which would correspond to the exact point on the, on the engineering stress strain curve. So if we're looking now for um, the material, we would have to also realize that tension and compression are not, we don't get exactly the same curves 
because the material in compression is usually stronger than the material in tension. And therefore, we recognize that we have two values for the ultimate. S ultimate compression uh, is equal to S ultimate tension uh, when we have uh, a ductile material, generally. And if we have a brittle material, like concrete, for example, S ultimate compression for concrete is way bigger than S ultimate uh, intention for the same material. And that is, in general, true uh, when we talk about brittle materials in here. So this will be true for brittle materials. Uh, so I'm going to uh, stop here.